We're live on the, hey, on the new single machine, the internet again. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to another Animal Rights Show. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, with us Patrice Jones. Patrice is, uh, is an ecofeminist uh, writer, educator and activist. And she's also the co-founder of uh, Vine Sanctuary, which is um, an LGBTQ brand sanctuary in, in Vermont. And uh, will help us explore um, intersectionality and how we can use uh, the concept of intersectionality in order to examine real life issues and seek solutions. So, um, Tom, would you like to say um, hello, the hellos for today? Yes, yeah. Um, yeah Tom, Tom. Tom. Uh, <laughs> 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 I, okay, I got, I got the cue, I got the cue. Um, so hello to uh, VegMet Codbot, good to see you, to see you join us again. Hello to Dan, Drop Even Grandad, Louisa, hi there. Hi, Terry. Hello, Ronnie, uh, Amber, uh, Joanna. She usually doesn't comment, but thought she'd say hello this time. Uh, hi, Joanna. Hi, hi, I started to say hi to Joanna if she commented. <laughs> Howdy to Deb. Uh, good evening to um, Jeremy. And hello to Bernie. Hello to Marion. That's my mom. Uh, and hello to Rama as well. Oh, how lovely to see yeah. everyone! Great. <laughs> um, so, I've, if if um, if everyone doesn't mind, I've got a couple of quotes from um, from some of Patrice's work, actually, just to start us off. So, the first one is from a book called *The Oxen at the Intersection*, and um, the quote goes this way: "So, it's everything humans do to animals, all their habitats, is done by humans in particular social, economic, and environmental circumstances." all of which have been shaped by sexism, racism, and other forms of oppression among human beings. To ignore these circumstances and the social injustices that create them is to risk unproductive or even counterproductive results. If we want to create change for animals in the real world, we must take intersectionality into account. And the second one, um, which is from this book, Ecofeminism, feminist intersections with other animals in the earth, and Patrice has a has a chapter in this book, which is brilliant, by the way. And this is a shorter one. As with all of the intersections of oppression, the upside of seeing the junction is recognizing opportunities for intervention. So I think that sums up beautifully. But but um, hey, Wendy, did you did you get the title of that first book right? But the option at the intersection. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, this is a bit. I'll, I'll tell you about this bit. Bit of an in joke. This during, during the week, I said oxen at the what is it crossroads, and they've <laughs> crossroads, <laughs> and the team have been ribbing me ever since. So if I make that mistake, you'll know why. But I'll try not to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so really, um, what I wanted to start start with is. Um, in the movement at the moment, Patrice, and I'm sure you would have noticed this and, and everyone on the panel, intersex intersectional is thrown around as some kind of identity marker and it's almost thrown around as an insult and it's in toxic threads, especially on social media. The main objection seems to be that advocates are being... Um, the advocates who, who are pro-intersexual, for example, are being speciesist by putting human rights above those of the other animals, or they're at least bringing human issues into a movement that ought to be focused on other animals because this is their movement and human issues are a distraction. But what I've come to see, and especially through um, Patrice's work, is that I've come to see that pro-intersectionality is actually really a way of looking at issues in the context of a bigger picture and, and to look at um, the reality of the, of the issues in the environment that they actually occur and looking at where oppressions reinforce each other and to find maybe where the vulnerabilities of those links are so that you can intervene. I would, have I kind of understood that yeah. well, Patrice, or? Um, yes, 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 you've said that, you've said that beautifully. You, you, you've summarized the, um, the mistaken attacks um, correctly and and um, and and you are grasping the, uh, the key fact about uh, what is sometimes called intersectionality which is that this is a this is a conceptual tool 
that we use to analyze problems um, in order to be better able to solve them. Um, now, I'll, it, it's not an identity. Uh, and, 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 and I will just say that at least here in the States, and I think, I think in the UK as well, uh, what has happened over time is that, um, so some of us have been thinking in this particular way for decades. Um, uh, the term intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in the late 1980s. Before that, we used a, a rather more clunky term, uh, the interconnectedness of oppressions, um, and uh, to, 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 to mean pretty much the same thing. So what we were interested in doing, um, well, wait, before I say what we were interested in doing, what it's important to understand is that this is a kind of systems thinking. And it arose, um, uh, uh, shortly, as a, as as a, as a result of a, an intellectual process wherein people began to understand that problems can't be solved in isolation, right? And so, uh, some decades earlier, ecological thinking uh, started to take hold within the natural sciences, and we understood, we began to understand uh, that the problem that the fish in in this pond over there are having might actually be caused by some smokestack um, several miles away, uh, creating some air pollution, which did something to birds, which then did something to insects, which then did something to those frogs, right? Um, and so uh, uh, within the natural sciences, uh, folks began to understand that um, isolating a problem and then trying to solve that problem in isolation works for some problems, but for most problems, we need to take a more ecological approach. This then filtered out into the social sciences. In psychology, we began to understand that you needed to look at family systems. Um, in, in, and and we, could, we could go on and on with the different fields that have, um, have, have taken to thinking more uh, ecologically. Um, and so I see intersectionality, which arose among activists who are trying to think through uh, initially uh, how do uh, sexism and racism uh, interact with one another? Uh, how do they support one another? How to, do they multiply one another? How do they interact in ways that create new and different forms of oppression? Uh, and then looking at um, uh, other forms of oppression and how they related to all of that. So, so, so what we're trying to do is to understand uh, 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 problems in their full context, and, and it's not a simple thing to do. It's 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 kind of a complicated thing to do. Uh, the upside, as you said, uh, is that when we analyze uh, these problems, then we also uh, start to see opportunities for intervention and opportunities that are uh, for interventions that are particularly useful. Um, so. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I, I thought I was going to say something else, but I, I seem to have forgotten what the other thing I was going to say is. Uh, but oh, that happens so, to me all the time. <laughs> I, 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 I would say that the, 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 so, so everybody, both people who are think who are who who are who are what you were calling pro intersectional, um, uh, uh, and and those who are anti, uh, really need to stop thinking of intersectional as some sort of, of, of identity and and understand that this is a this is a problem solving tool, um, and I, I can't understand why anyone would be against us having an additional problem solving tool uh, that will help us to better understand. The situations of animals and be better able to craft interventions that are likely to work in the real world where nothing happens in a vacuum and everything is connected to everything else. Mm. Patrice, uh, what, what, that, oh, go ahead now. Okay, I just uh, want to ask something. Um, even those that embrace intersectionality in the movement, they mm. tend to see the majority at least as the sum of different oppressions. And uh, I remember in the book, you described this as a chemical reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and that metaphor uh, made me really understand what happens when uh, oppressions meet. Would you like to, to, to explain that? Sure. 
so 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 before before so when Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality, uh, she's a black legal scholar. Uh, she was looking specifically at the problems uh, that black women face in the workplace, and she was looking specifically at um, uh, a, a, a particular problem where a black woman would face workplace um, discrimination and be unable to do anything about it because she couldn't call it sex discrimination because it wasn't happening to the white women. And she couldn't call it race discrimination because it wasn't happening to the black men. Um, it was discrimination that was resulting from a particular interaction of racism and sexism and only affecting black women. Um, so prior to her coining that phrase, the term that sometimes got used for race and sex was double jeopardy, like uh, racism plus sexism equals worse. Um, and it is worse. Uh, but that was a little too simplistic, she's suggesting. What she was what she was interested in showing and what we've now shown with regard to many 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 different forms of of oppression and how they relate to one another is that these different forms of oppression can interact in a multiplicative way so as to create some new and different forms of of of, of discrimination or exploitation um what's important for us to understand uh as animal advocates is that as as in the quote that you read everything that's being done to animals by people is being done to animals by people um and so if we don't understand people um then we're actually not going to be able to figure out how to stop people from hurting animals that seems pretty simple to me um and people are social animals emotional animals who are very much affected uh, in their thinking and in their behavior by their social circumstances. Their social circumstances include all of these uh, problems that we're looking at. Uh, so of course we need to be thinking of those things when we're thinking about um, um, trying to stop the things that people do to animals, but it's more than that, okay? So if you imagine, so here is here are all of these things that, here are all the different ways that humans hurt other humans, right? And what intersectionality classically understood is saying is that these things are all related to one another. Uh, they interact, they support one another. Um, if you only look at one in isolation, it's hard to solve all of them, right? And so what, what I and some other eco-feminists are saying is all of this is both affects and is affected by how people treat the larger than human world, meaning animals and what gets called the environment. Um, and that the causality goes both ways. In other words, that some of the ideas that we have because of this mess of all the ways that we abuse each other, some of those ideas turn out to be foundational ideas for the exploitation of animals or the exploitation of the environment. And similarly, uh, many of the ideas that are foundational to our, uh, to human supremacy over um, uh, non-human animals and the larger than human world um, filter back over and influence the way that humans hurt each other. And so it's in everybody's best interest. The causality is going both ways and it's in everybody's best interest uh, to understand that. And that's why people like me are not only talking to animal rights folks about, hey, we need to pay attention to these intersections, but I'm also over talking to social justice activists and environmental activists saying, uh, yo, you need to be thinking about animals. Um, so uh, it, 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 a classic example is, um, is uh, actually it goes right to the point of your where's the body. Uh, so uh, a classic example of, of this is, is the intersection between speciesism and ableism. And ableism is the word that we use for um, uh, 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 the discrimination against um, the attitudes and, and behaviors that lead to the discrimination against and exploitation of people with disabilities. And it turns out that the ideology of ableism is pretty much exactly the same 
as the ideology of speciesism. If you think about uh, what are what are what are what are the what are what are the justifications that people give for human supremacy? Um, and there's there's usually only two big ones. One um, is the whole God made other animals for us to 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 use. And and by the way, that's also said about people with disabilities that that their disabilities reflect some sort of sin, and God means for us to punish them. Um, but if we if we set aside the religious for a moment, uh, then uh, usually it comes down to the idea that humans have some uh, capability that non-human animals don't have, such as rationality or memory or an ability to imagine the future or tool use or whatever the case might be, um, or some, some aggregation of, of abilities. Um, and that because of these abilities, we are self-evidently superior and because of this alleged superiority, we have the right um, to exploit, to dispossess, to control the reproduction <coughs> of, to force to work without pay, et cetera, et cetera, non-human animals. But if you look at the structure of that argument, that's ableism. That's saying uh, those who have certain abilities that others don't have, have the right uh, to do all of these things. And by the way, all of those things have been done to people with disabilities. Um, so, so, so with people with disabilities and non-human animals, it's literally the exact same argument justifying the exact same exploitative behavior. And I think that's useful to understand. Actually, in your book, Patrice, um, The Oxen at the Intersection, I think it's a beautiful example of real life that's what I really found in that book is that it was a real life situation and it seemed like such a simple situation in having these two oxen that were to be so-called retired and they were being offered sanctuary by by you and, and your partner at Vine and yet it didn't work out that way and obviously the book goes in to describe the 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 events but also your analysis of those events was really eye-opening in terms of how everything was intersecting the, the the humans that were involved the activists that were involved the the way it all played out i think if i think every animal advocate needs to read that book de de definitely it's just such a, a great explanation now Nella and i are always talking about, <laughs> about oh, yeah. that book about the oxen. It just we're always like oh the oxen the oxen this yeah. <laughs> because yeah, it's just such a great explanation yeah and mm -hmm. we had then a ha moment in, in every page and yeah. One of the things that uh, stand out is the idea of um, overdetermination mm -hmm. that I was not aware of at all. Mm -hmm. And how does this play in uh, planning uh, campaigns and strategies? Mm -hmm. So, do so, you want to talk about that? Yes, please. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so for, for, for those who haven't read it, the, the book, The Oxen at the Intersection, uh, tells the story of our failed attempt. Uh, to offer refuge uh, to two oxen who had been used to pull a plow at a nearby college. Um, and uh, and uh, when, when one of them had a minor ankle injury and so they could no longer pull the plow, the college decided that they would, uh, even though they'd been using them as informal mascots for, for years and they were beloved, uh, allegedly by the, the town and the students, they decided to um, kill them and make them into hamburgers. Um, People complained, uh, the complainers contacted us, we offered them refuge, uh, and then this big mess happened um, involving online petitions and uh, charges of terrorism. And, uh, uh, and, and in the end, uh, well, we were not able uh, to save them. And so just like, um, a doctor who loses a patient, uh, I feel like we need to learn from our failures. And so I decided uh, to, 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 to really look really closely at what exactly had happened, because of course we were all caught up in it as it was happening, um, and try to understand why and how it was that we, uh, that we failed. Um, and I found that I really couldn't explain uh, what happened uh, without reference uh, 
uh, to whiteness and the role that white identity plays uh, 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 in um, in the uh, uh, subordination of animals uh, here in in Vermont, but also in the USA, we're seeing it right now. Um, I, I don't know how much you follow U.S. news, but right now uh, there are a whole bunch of right-wing politicians um, complaining about the relatively minor uh, suggestions in in one of Biden's, I think, climate plans about eating less meat, and uh, they're 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 storming around on social media, um, uh, uh, talking about how many pounds of meat they must eat. Uh, and, 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 and it's very clear that something about meat eating is very tied to their feeling of Americanism, um, but white Americanism in particular, even though they don't often say the white. I so, remember, sorry, Patrice, I just wanted to say, I remember that there was a, in the presidential elections, there was a, a, a talk by Mike Pence in which he kind of virtue signaled to that about, mm -hmm. and he, he mentioned Kamala Harris with the idea of taking away our meat. Mm -hmm. you mentioned, um, <laughs> right. Right. So, I mean, we're all in this context. I mean, uh, I think I think uh, it's very clear uh, that different uh, different places are different. That's one of my big points. So I don't want to make it seem as though this is true across the board. Uh, so here in the United States, race is very uh, much a part of, of of the identity of many meat producers and many meat consumers. But I think um, in, in, in most places, uh, the association between meat and masculinity uh, is is holds true, and uh, to me, it's just absurd uh, that we would think we would ever be able to do anything about meat eating uh, without taking that on uh, head on and factoring an, an awareness of that into our strategies. That just seems nonsensical to me. Um, so, but overdetermination, just very quickly, is the idea. Uh, uh, that uh, things that happen uh, sometimes have multiple compounding causes. And you can look at a thing that happened and you could say, well, this might have caused it. Oh, and this other thing might have caused it. Oh, and this other thing might have caused it. And they were all working together uh, to overdetermine that outcome. If that, that's a simple way of saying it. Mm -hmm. and we okay. certainly saw that in that case. But I'm, I'm so glad that you both in, uh, got something out of that book because it, obviously it was not my intent to just write a book that would, for, without learning anything else, try to explain what that one situation did. I, I, was, mm -hmm. I see that one situation as a case study. And you know, yeah. in, in many, many realms of learning, we use case studies. And so uh, the book is structured so that the first part of it just tells the story of what happened, but then the second half is the analysis of what happened. And I do hope uh, the aim was to use that to, to make that analysis one that people could then use to look at their own cases in their own situation. I, I think you, you were very successful at that. Mm. De learned definitely, so many I things from that book. I learned so much and I can and what I wanted to ask you actually in relation to what you just said there Patrice is I think part of the issue and, and actually you you allude to this in the book as well is that we we are not in in the so-called um, global north western world whatever we want to think of it as we're not um, encouraged to think in an intersectional or more holistic contextual way where we're taught to separate everything out like you only have to look at like the medical profession and see how everything is just compartmentalized into different things you, no one looks at the whole picture of of the health of the person mm -hmm. and and our, and our whole society seems to be like that we're very much we look at separate things in a, with a laser beam and we don't look at the big picture so how i think obviously to get to get good at anything we have to practice how can we better practice and get better at looking at things in a contextual more of an, within the environment of the of the issues socially economically um in order to get good at looking at where we can intervene how do we get better at that how can we start to do that do you think because that's something i'd love to practice myself and sometimes i feel a bit lost i'm a bit like oh where do i start with this issue mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I tried to come up with, um, I'm afraid I can't give you a, a, a handy acronym uh, for the things to think about. I tried to, <laughs> Damn, I, I, I was hoping. 
No, I'll, 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 three, I'll send three you, steps. I'll, I'll send you a link to the to the, to the web post, to the blog post that uh, I was thinking about. How do I teach this? And so I came up with this way of thinking about it, and um, and I gave a talk, and then I wrote a blog post. But then a lot of people that read the blog post were like, "No, this was too hard." Um, so I, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna suggest that. I would suggest just asking yourself. One, I would suggest um, thinking with a pencil uh, and, and, and getting it out on, on some paper or a whiteboard or something like that where you can just sort of spread out and you're not trying to immediately go right into straight lines going in one direction. So so sort of write down what's the problem you're trying or the situation. That's the big thing is, is, is think about problems as situations. And, then, and, and as soon as you you shift into situation, well, then you start to ask, well, what is the situation? Where is it happening? Who are the people involved? Uh, where are they? What are their needs? What are their, um, what are, what are the social and environmental ecologies in which they exist? What is the, what is the literal physical place where this is happening? Uh, what, what, what are the physical or material um, not determinants, but pushes on people's behavior, right? Um, so if, 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 you, if you were, we'll take it away from um, animals for a second. If, if, if you're thinking about something like, um, this is a relatively simple one, like, like recycling. And, and, and you wanted to improve recycling rates in some place. The first thing you'd ask is, well, you know, is there some place for people to take their recycling? Are there, are there recycling bins around? Um, what are the what are the things that the people know? Are they motivated? How can we? What could we do to make people be more motivated? Uh, is it emotional? Is it social? Can we bring peer pressure in? Um, so, I may have gone off base with that uh, with that example. So, I would say uh, to just sort of map out what are the what as many aspects as you can think of of the problems as many different determinants as you can think of of the be if there's some behavior problematic behavior you're trying to solve right um and then uh and then then you can start to think about where you could intervene and it's and, and you're never going to be able to do all the things that you could do none of us are, there are so many determinants to um uh to any form of animal exploitation right you've got you've got all the 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 ideologies, the thoughts and feelings of, that people have. Um, if we're thinking about animal consumption, there's all the traditions, there's whether it's easy or not to make this shit, there's money, um, there's identity, um, there's gender, all of that is playing a role in uh, the, 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 the individual consumer's choice. But it's not just the individual consumer, it's also the people who are making money uh, by making these animal products, and okay, well, if they can't make money that way, how are they going to make money um, and feed their own families? And what's the exact um, um, process by which uh, somebody who's currently exploiting cows could stop exploiting cows, shift to plant-based milk, and still um, be able to feed themselves? Uh, uh, that's another one. And then there's the corporate, there's so many factors. So then you can see there are all these different things that need to be done. And I don't mean to suggest that, oh, well, then it's insurmountable. What I mean to say is that then there's a role for all of us to use whatever our particular skills are, whatever our particular interests are, to work on the piece of the problem that we're in the best position to do something about right uh to seize whatever opportunities are uh we have um and i do suggest making a little um i don't know a list or something of what are you, where are you what's what's your standpoint what are the things that you can see that other people can't see what are the things that you can do that some other people might not be able to do uh what does uh your 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 regional location uh your identity in various ways what, what what does that what possibilities does that open up for you and what are the things that then you could do and so then what i do want to say is that we don't 
the pro- one problem I've seen just so often in vegan and animal rights is is um, self-appointed um, leaders saying really super simplistic things, and then also saying, and so we all have to do this. Mm. And no, uh, if we all, whatever that this is, if we all do it, there are so many other things that are not going to get done. Uh, mm. So instead of trying to you know, bully each other into all doing exactly the same thing. That's like the opposite of what we need to be doing. Mm-hmm. We, all, we need to be yeah. thinking about all the things that need to be done and then and then thinking about what we are in a pr- particular position to do and then, and then doing our best at those things and mm-hmm. trusting that others are doing the same. So Patrice, I, 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 I don't suppose you've got anybody in mind when you say uh, uh-huh. say that. But um, <laughs> uh, th- there's been there's been a couple of comments that we ought to kind of d- deal with yeah. in questions before we um, before we lose them. Uh, mm-hmm. The first I think is probably from Rama. This is about the vegan bros. I uh-huh. thought they, I, th- yeah. I thought they'd gone <laughs> who, are, who are giddy with their newfound understanding of speciesism, and so any I'm not quite sure. What that last word is, to be honest. So, anybody, anybody, anybody in the team know know um, what the vegan bros are doing right now? No. Oh, these vegan bros. So, are you th- thinking of general vegan bros? Uh, Wait, I'm, there, I'm reading the. There were two vegan bros, um, American guys, I believe, who kind of came in and out of the movement, and, um, oh, and they, they, they were basically saying that. That um, if you vote, you could vote for Trump and be vegan and all this kind of thing, but then they disappeared. But I think I, I think that Rama's point could also refer to some of the white um, male vegans in the movement as well. You know, I think it's somewhat um, uh, on point there. Hmm. I know the vegan bros turned up at one of those gatherings and said that the vegan the vegan movement had made them both into billionaires or something. They, they were boasting about that, but. Um, Anyway, maybe we could move on to that on to um, this one then. So, so no, 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 no. I, 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 okay, we'll go back. Sorry. I, I do think I do think. Um, so there, there's, I, I'm having cross cutting reactions inside myself, both of which I feel like I want to articulate. On the one hand, it's absolutely incumbent upon us to recognize uh, that the animal rights movement itself exists within social circumstances and therefore is itself patterned by or will be patterned by things like sexism and racism unless we very mindfully make it not so Mm. um so so oh yes (laughs) so so, um and 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 so we, we we certainly are seeing um here in the states and i presume there too uh 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 I don't know whether this is what Rana, Rama meant by vegan bros, but we certainly are seeing some certain uh, white men with a certain kind of charisma and a certain becoming influencers um, and and uh, accumulating giant followings for their really mediocre ideas. Um, and I would recommend everybody read that book, Mediocre. Um, uh, I'm blanking on the author's name. Uh, so I do think we all have uh, some obligation to push back against that, to at least point at it and, and identify it when it's happening. Um, I surely wish, I surely wish uh, that the that the, the fans of, of these guys uh, would be more um, thoughtful. Uh, but I, I have to say, so so on the one hand, I feel like I need or we need. I need sometimes to, to do when I, when I'm when I become aware of something particularly problematic that some problematic vegan bro has done or said, then I I, I will feel like I need to push back. But I feel like I, I I it's not it's not a good use of my own mental energy to spend a lot of time thinking about what what they are doing and um and saying um and 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 to take that energy and instead just pour it into doing the work. Uh, the way that I feel like the work needs to be to be done. Sometimes uh, in the movement, we tend to follow some some ideas uh, that s- sound real and sound reasonable. Uh, and, and I'll give you an example. Um, I, I used to love the idea of abolition. 
I still do because I would love I would love all oppressions to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I found myself in a very very difficult position when I had to decide to uh, support some uh, welfareist campaigns mm -hmm. that I thought that they are going to offer uh, um, some relief to the animals already here. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a specific um, instance about uh, the Greek donkeys. Uh, Greek donkeys uh, are only exist in sanctuaries or are exploited as transport uh, in a really bad conditions. So there was an uproar uh, a couple of years ago uh, to do something to demand legal changes about the, the donkey situation. And I was thinking that uh, I should not support that because uh, it's just a, an welfare is reform and it's not going to bring the donkeys closer to, to their liberation and it's counterproductive and after have all discussion this discussion and rational arguments with myself at the end i signed the petition because i felt that um mostly i had to answer to those individuals that were standing at that moment under the scorching sun without food without water uh, abused and beaten and at that specific moment uh, being true to some uh, theory didn't make sense to me I I'll never know if, that, if this was the, the right decision to make but uh, my gut feeling told, told me that uh, my uh, my first obligation is to, towards uh, the animals that exist right now and not that the future generations of uh, animals that will come mm -hmm. so uh how do you feel about uh, the abolitionist theory so i feel that it's a um i feel that the um i feel that the welfare abolition binary is to a certain degree a false binary um, predicated on the idea that um, really the Trotskyist idea uh, that anything you do uh, to relieve suffering for animals now must necessarily impede um, the effort to liberate animals in the long run. I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure, I've not seen any data that would suggest that that's true. Now, it's certainly the case that uh, there are um, false welfare campaigns. There are, there are people who are welfareist in the sense of literally believing that animals belong to humans, that humans have the right uh, to dominate animals and own animals, but that we need to treat them a little nicer, right? So there certainly are people who, who believe that. I'm not actually, I'm not thinking about them. I'm thinking about the larger group of, of people who absolutely sincerely support animal liberation in, in and, and want it to come as soon as possible. And recognize an obligation uh, to do something about suffering in the here and now. Um, and again, I've, I've, uh, so, so the question then becomes uh, whether you are going to support some particular effort to uh, alleviate suffering now, right? Um, you know, in your heart of hearts that the this particular use of donkeys is not going to end this year you hope very much it will end in the long run but you know for sure it's not going to end this year so what uh so what are you going to do um for the donkeys who are suffering right now uh, i don't i'm not seeing anything that would suggest helping the donkeys who, who live right now in any way inhibits your effort to liberate them in the long run um and so i see it mostly as a false dichotomy and, and i feel i feel pretty strongly uh that um um that animals have voices um mm -hmm. and, and um uh 
uh, we are we're not the voice of the voiceless, non-human animals um, express themselves often vocally through actual sound waves, voices, but also through gesture and many other ways um, and tell us what it is they want. Um, I, as a human, do not have the right to overrule animals telling me what they want and then call myself an animal liberationist and then call myself someone who supports self-determination of non-human animals. If I support self-determination of non-human animals, um, then I need to listen to animals uh, when they're telling me what they want. And animals who are suffering that tell us quite clearly what they want. Now, relieving none of us, right? None of us can help all the animals. So, so we're always going to be making some choices about where to spend our particular time. And so I'm not saying that everyone is obligated to act on every single um, instance of animal suffering because it's literally physically impossible and you're not mandated to do things that are physically impossible. Um, but I would say that you are mandated not to interfere with others who are trying to relieve suffering. I think that if animal, if animal or animals has expressed, I am suffering and some human um, is doing something with the aim of relieving that suffering. Um, I may or may not elect to join them in that, but I absolutely do not have a right to interfere with their efforts to do that. Patrice, in the, in the book, you talk about this in, in terms of being a sacrifice, like the, uh, like in terms of, of um, abolitionist or uh, ab abolitionist activist will uh, it's almost like they're they're willing to sacrifice the mm -hmm. well-being of other animals that are being exploited today for the adherence to abstract principles because um the the aid that might be given to relieve the suffering of the anim of the other animals now transgresses any abs uh, abstract principles that they hold dear mm -hmm. and i just wonder in terms of something that troubles me and and demos that i've that i've been to um at live export protests and think things like that or at slaughterhouses places like that for example if activists are when when the trucks are stopped for example containing other animals these are live real individuals the emotions that come out at those times are just so incredibly intense and uh, heightened and when when i've been at these places it's that, that i just get that feeling of is this is this right for these individuals? Because they're, they're going to be carried on their truck to wherever, you know, is it right that we should stop these individuals and, and prolong their horrific journey and prolong their suffering? And they're probably terrified and they don't know what's going on. We're all shouting and screaming at the truck. And then, and, and I get that real kind of tr troubled, um, you know, mind is like, I've, we're trying to do the best in terms of we're, we're protesting and we're, we're being the voice of dissent in allyship to these to these individuals but also in this moment we are making their lives probably a little bit worse because we're prolonging the journey we're making them more frightened how do, what do you feel about that kind of situation how do we weigh up what's best for these individuals and also trying to get that balance of trying to change you know things and, and improve the situation for future individuals it's a, it's a, d a difficult thing isn't it it, it is, and, 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 and I commend you for, for, for staying with um, your feelings of, of, of worry and discomfort. I, I think a, a, a big piece of the challenge for us is not to, um, not, to, not to just push through and do things that make us feel good. Uh, we're, it, it's a very, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, thing we're choose, trying to do here, right? In, in, in every other kind of liberation movement, the, the, the people the people are who are the subjects of the liberation movement mm -hmm. are at the forefront are making decisions, right? And so I, I don't have to worry as a lesbian um, that, you know, st straight men will decide the direction of my movement. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, 
but with 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 non-human animals if the animal rights activists aren't circumspect don't try to listen to animals that could happen um and and there's a lot of um there's a lot of uh It feels great to be a hero. Um, it, it probably feels really heroic to proclaim yourself the voice of the voiceless, uh, and 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 so and so. Um, um, no, to Deb, nobody's. We're not talking about humane meat. That's a. Um, uh, so so. Um, um, these are difficult things, right? These are difficult things. Uh, to do, to, to, to try and, um, we're influenced by human supremacy too, right? And human supremacy tells us that people know best about everything. We know, uh, we know best about everything. We can, we know how to re-engineer the climate. Uh, we, uh, and, 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 and so to really be an advocate for animals, you have to like, confront your own speciesism, confront your own human supremacy, confront your own assumptions that as the human being, you know best, um, and really place yourself in the position of the non-human animals for whom you're advocating, and really ask yourself, is this what they would want me to do? If they were in possession of all the information that I'm in possession of, is this what they would want me to do? I can't tell you what the answer is in the particular situation, you're describing all I would say is I would stay with the discomfort I would stay with this um, this question and for me at least if I were going to do something um, that I felt in some way um, caused um, some animals um, additional grief I would I would need to feel really certain that that uh, whatever that action was was a strategically useful action mm -hmm. and that it wasn't something that i was just doing to feel like i was doing something or mm -hmm. or, or or to feel good about myself actually um, ic makes that makes a really good point re regarding this particular kind of action and um roger it's at 6 45 i think i think you just brought it up a moment ago and and ic says animals don't want to be killed as quickly as possible in the overwhelming majority of cases they very obviously try as hard as possible no, to stay absolutely. alive and obviously that and that's true, isn't it? It's like a, you, you, because you worry that you're making them uh, uncomfortable and delaying their journey, but actually you're also you're keeping them alive for longer. So well, it's, it's it is it's, it's it, these are just vexingly difficult. Mm, um, yeah. uh, I think it's 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 true that animals don't mostly don't want to be killed as quickly as possible. Though sometimes, um, oh, I'm thinking of. Um, I'm thinking of something that Karen Davis of United Poultry Concerns once said about um, certain kinds of just living misery, um, and I think it was about some changes to battery cages, and that 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 made it possible to keep the hens in the cages a little bit longer, um, and so now they would be um, they you know the hens weren't dying as quickly, and so they were living three months longer, um, and the and this was being presented as if it were a welfare improvement. Um, and, and she was arguing that it's not because three months longer in that misery is not necessarily an improvement. Um, so I think it's really, really tricky. And, and uh, the thing that I, I did write a whole paper about this whole welfare abolition thing. And I actually provided like s steps to think through whether or not you would want to support a so-called um, welfare improvement uh, and um, and one of them I say is that you know we can't we can't just say blanketly I support welfare or I don't support welfare. And you have to look at what is this specific thing that people are saying they would like to do, and will it really bring genuine relief to some animals or not? And that's the first thing. I think one key to all that is whether um, a single issues. I, I tend to not think of single issue campaigns, but single issue events mm. and whether they could be abolitionized. And, that, and that's one way of doing it. We've mm -hmm. still got a couple of um, things we like to uh, deal with comments um, yeah. and we've still got a couple outstanding. So I want to come back to that if I may. Um, this one, um, 
It's about Peter. No, no, it's about ableism. Um, what's, what's the difference? Eh? So thanks for drawing on ableism. It's important to understand how all injustices intersect from Joanna. It's um, we, we talk a lot about uh, language in this show, uh, Patrice, and ableist language is absolutely rife in this movement. And it's almost as though in terms of society, it, it's on it's on a par with speciesist language. You know, there's just it's just everywhere. And so, whenever when you go on YouTube, and you can't you can't be on there for more than ten minutes before you encounter ableist language. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean that's true in the wider world as well. Uh, mm. uh, the the and particularly when you look at um, ableist language, uh, referencing people with um, developmental disabilities, <coughs> pediatric disabilities. I mean that's still uh, considered quite quite normal. Um, uh, uh, both. So this is, in my view, this is an example of, look, there's problems in the wider world and those problems are going to exist in our movement as well unless we mindfully do something about them. So I think, I think some piece of that ableism that you, we might see in um, vegan or animal liberation um, videos or, 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 or speeches uh, just comes down to ableism in the wider culture. But if we understood better the intersection between ableism and speciesism, maybe we'd be more motivated to clean up our language around that. I do think, though, that you know there are some people who uh, promote uh, veganism uh, uh, as 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 a, as a health uh, diet, and I, I certainly don't want to uh, disagree about vegan being healthy as a way to eat. But um, you certainly do see uh, among uh, among some of the folks who promote uh, veganism for, for health reasons, uh, a fair amount of ableism, um, as well as fat phobia and the like. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think it's perfectly, I don't think that it's, it's necessary. Uh, and I think it's harmful. And I think it's perfectly possible uh, to promote the health aspects of veganism without going down that road. Mm, certainly shouldn't f fat shame as some as some groups do. Go, going all the way back to where we started, really in the in the conversation about intersectionals, um, um, Jeremy Hess. That's that's the name that we all remember. Um, now I'm not quite sure whether this is. I mean, I don't think this is Jeremy's uh, position, but it's one fear of the people who are critical of pro intersectionality is that the animal movement is becoming human centric. And so, um, I mean, I, I think I think that's a false fear because the focus of the animal movement has always, consistently, and forever been about other animals. And so, I I think it's a false fear. But um, Jeremy says we already lack a focus on our fellow fellow animals. In my humble opinion, could it? Could anybody agree with that? I, I, I think, think that I, I, I would say there's probably a lack of focus on the um, uh, the individual kind of ag agency of, of animals, which speaks to a lot of the work that, that Jeremy's doing and trying to focus on the, the individuals and their characteristics and stuff. And I know that Patrice and the work, that, the work that I'm not entirely familiar with all your work because I still have a lot of room to do, but um, you talk about, don't you, about this idea of survivorship, moving away from focusing on suffering and survivorship to... to mm -hmm. um, um, Kind of re revere the agency that they have. I think there is a lack of focus there, but I also think that with um, the folks that come into the movement who are perhaps more susceptible to these anti-intersectional <laughs> um, uh, critiques, is there is an element of 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 of, um, of work that needs to be done in terms of listening to people's lived experiences, doing some reading and learning, and I think people maybe just aren't aren't willing or need understand the importance of doing that, um, which is absolutely necessary. Well, so here's the, here's the thing. Um, we're all humans. Um, and, and so the, the, sadly, the, the, the animal rights movement among humans is doomed to be human centric. Um, until until such time as we've dismantled enough of 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 of, of, of the animal industrial complex for for the, for non-human animals to take leadership 
of, 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 of that movement. And so we all uh, are in this position, even before we start to think about how um, uh, whatever racism or sexism or ableism is still in your conscious mind from, from your own social circumstances, we all have to confront our own speciesism, our own um, um, human supremacy, supremacist ideas. And so certainly it's possible. I'm not going to say it's not possible. It's certainly possible that, um, you know, paying attention uh, to, uh, it's certainly true that, that humans who are not vegan, who are involved in um, social justice uh, efforts do privilege humans. Absolutely. That's absolutely the case. Uh, um, and so does everybody else who's not in the animal, animal rights movement. Um, and so, yes, of course, it would be important um, if you're someone who is um, uh, uh, trying to think intersectionally uh, to interrogate yourself and make sure you're not um, in some way elevating uh, human concerns um, over uh, the concerns of non-human animals, at least insofar as you're trying to be an animal advocate. But I think it actually goes much, much uh, uh, deeper than that. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think how to say this. Uh, so we're all, I'm sorry, we're all human, right? And, 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 and so it's really hard not to put your own interests above those of animals when you're being an animal advocate, right? Mm -hmm. And so here you are, and let's just say you're a, you're a white man and, um, um, If you're just speaking for animals and you're saying i'm their voice then you actually don't have any responsibility to look at your own privilege as a white man as a man among humans because you you've now put yourself as the voice for the animal and of course the animals don't have any power over anybody um and so as long as you're claiming to be their voice nobody can critique you for anything And so, of course, you would feel, um, you could possibly feel like when people start talking about, well, you know, we do have to pay attention to like sexism uh, and we need to pay attention to the role of gender in maintaining human supremacy. Um, well, then that's also going to be pushing you to look at your own power and privilege within your local animal rights group or in your life outside of the animal. And maybe that makes you uncomfortable. Um, and so in the same way that I would encourage, you know, uh, uh, those of us who are thinking intersectionally to, of course, always uh, be mindful that we're allies of animals when we're in that role. Um, I would also say the same to those who are critiquing it because it, it seems to me that mostly it's people who, who, are, who are being asked to give up power um, who are the ones complaining um, that, that this is taking yeah. the focus away from animals. And I think maybe they're taking the focus away from animals um, by uh, zealously defending um, their own um, uh, right not to have to look at their privilege, um, when in fact doing so would make them more effective animal advocates um if that makes if that made if that makes any sense look it's I, I, I think i might have said this in one of the videos you all mentioned uh, at, uh before the, the show started it's really easy as an animal advocate look we empathize with non-human animals and we are obliged as self-appointed advocates self-appointed advocates they didn't ever consent for you or me to be their voice. So we're self-appointed advocates. So it's incumbent upon us absolutely to um, uh, 
uh, use every ounce of imagination and empathy you can to think, what do they want? What would they like me to do? What would they endorse if I said it on their behalf? How can I, uh, they do have voices, how can I get other humans to hear their voices rather than hear me advocating for them, right? Um, and so we have to have this really live, intense, powerful identification with or empathy with the non-human animals for whom we're advocating. The issue here, the problem here is I think that could easily slip into an identification with the animal, into a feeling like, so since I'm advocating for animals, I must be as powerless as animals are. Um, and then that can lead you to not take adequate account of what your real social position among human beings is. And I just can't see any way that it would be in any way harmful to animals to ask every animal advocate to be mindful of what their own social position is among humans when talking to humans about how to stop what humans are doing to animals. Patricia, you mentioned, um, uh, I don't remember which speech was that, but uh, you've mentioned that the goal is for uh, the Earth to stop being a violent place mm -hmm. and not to try to get um, individual rights instead of trying to get individual mm -hmm. rights for animals or for other minorities that um, rights alone are, are not provide a solution to the problem and uh, the, the problem is going uh, to resolve if we m make this place non-violent so I'm, I'm thinking that if this is the, the rationale then it doesn't matter that much if we give or more uh, more or less consideration to uh, one specific group hmm. because at, at the same time we were uh, trying to liberate everyone yeah i i hear what you're saying i i i i i i i i i would say okay so i would just say for me like rights are um a, a tactic rather than a goal like like rights uh we, we've got currently got this um legal system that is backed by force of arms that encircles the entire globe and also is within every country and that's that is um, wishes of anarchists notwithstanding not going anywhere um, in the next decade, um, uh, or at least not immediately. Uh, and so to get some uh, rights within those legal systems can be enormously useful uh, to uh, animals, humans, trees, rivers, anybody who can get some rights within uh, those systems, that could be enormously useful in the immediate term and in the short term. And so I would never, um, I would never, even though I don't put my energy towards seeking rights, I would never, I would never put anybody, I'm glad that other people are. Um, and I, as long as, as long as we just see those as, 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 as tactics rather than the aim, then that's, that's, that's beautiful. Um, but I really liked what you were you were saying about well who does it uh, what does it matter if 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 they're advocating for this one or for that one if in the long run we're aiming for this unified uh, less violent less oppressive place and it, it just made me think like because I don't I'm a farm I run a farm animal sanctuary um, but I don't get mad at people who are advocating for tigers. Um, instead of for farmed animals. Like, I'm glad somebody's advocating for tigers. Um, and uh, I do see it, I do see my own analysis is such that what I see are an intersecting set of habits of belief and behavior by human beings that are harmful ways of being in the world. And these harmful ways of being in the world, these harmful ways of thinking about the world, these harmful ways of, 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 of getting what you want, these harmful ways of thinking of other people, they hurt um, animals, um, they hurt trees, uh, they hurt other human beings. 
and it's all related. And so it actually doesn't, it matters not at all to me in terms of my value for your work. If you're, if you're trying to help trees or humans or orangutans, um, as long as, as you're, as long as you're doing that work and you're doing that work in a way that is mindful of all those connections so that you're not hurting anybody while you're doing the work. And, and, and that's the real key here is being mindful of these things so that you can do your own work more effectively because your analysis is more accurate. And you can be sure you're not hurting anybody else accidentally while you're pursuing your piece of, 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 the, of the puzzle. Patrice, you just touched on, I know we've, we've kind of run over time a little bit, but I just, and you don't have to go into this a lot, but I just wonder touching on the rights thing there, because um, you've referred there to more well, the legal rights. And on the Animal Rights Show, we talk, we, we base what we talk about more on inherent rights, I suppose, protecting the individual. So, and I, and I wonder, because I'm really drawn to ecofeminist theory and the ecofeminist ethic of care mm. and community and all of this. Um, stuff, and I just wonder: Can inherent rights play a part in in ecofeminist ethic of care? So I'm not speaking about legal rights, but you know yeah. those basic rights not to be bred, used, or killed, and and how do we protect individuals without basic rights? Is there a way that we do that? What's your view on that? Well, I think it's more it, it's more about um, well, I should just say this first. So most pe people who aren't feminists don't realize that there are very many feminisms, um, and mm. there are also many. Not, not as many, but there are a few different ecofeminisms. So, so please don't mistake me for speaking for like all ecofeminists, because I'm certainly not. Um, but my way of thinking about it, and those of, of some other ecofeminists uh, with whom I'm in communion, is um, is that we're not really rights or not. It's just that's not the mental frame we have for it. We're thinking more about responsibilities um, within relationships. So, so um, uh, uh, we're in relationship with one another. Uh, uh, we're in multiple relationships. And what are our obligations of care to those with whom we're in relation? And, and, and so it's not that this is counter to rights. It's more that the, the, the the way of thinking rights is more about like, okay, here I as this individual have these rights and I have these rights and we're going to balance these rights against each other. And this is more like, okay, we're in relationship to one another. What do we owe one another? But does um, that not, if does that not then allude to duties, which would then relate to the other side of that coin is the rights, the inherent right then gives the other person a duty not to, um, you know, not to, to, well, to respect those rights, it, 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 they, I, they I have a duty. Also, of, maybe yeah. uh, uh, Wendy. Also, maybe duties of assistance. Yeah, duties yeah. of assistance, duty of duty of care mm -hmm. in a way to, so, to to others and respecting those rights. Is, are they not so, the two sides of the same thing? Really, if we have responsibilities and duties, that 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 kind of implies that the other individual has has rights to have those duties respect um, carried out. If that makes sense. Yeah, I, 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 I I'm not disagreeing with any of this. I'm just sort of saying that. So it's it's more a matter of like what's the mental frame you're using to look at this question of of um, uh, what we owe uh, to one another, um, and you know not only what we're obliged to do, but what we're obliged not to do, um, uh, in in order to enable mutual flourishing. You know, I would also say that the issue of rights for me. Uh, is uh, complicated by the fact that, um, uh, uh, at least within Western circles, we're thinking about individual rights um, as opposed to collective uh, uh, rights. And, and, and to me, uh, the co collectives are, 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 are important as well. Um, but so I'm not, I'm not counter, so what I'm, I'm not counteracting the, my way of thinking, I'm just saying it's, a, it's a, like a different way of thinking through the same questions and it might mm. use, I come to, sometimes when you're using different ways, you'll still come to the same conclusion. It's just a different yeah. process, right? Mm. Um, mm. And if you're familiar with Carol Gilligan's work about the different kinds of moral reasoning, the ethos of justice versus the ethos of care, that's what I'm really talking about here. Um, and people who are using those different ethoses can still come to the same 
uh, conclusion about what ought to be done or not done, but they're but they're they're using a different mental pathway uh, to get to get there. But I Thank know. You. Um, go ahead. Sorry, I thought you. No, I just was. I know we're we're almost out of out of time here, and yeah. so I didn't want to. I, I, I wish we had uh, another hour. <laughs> There's yeah, so many amazing yeah. comments coming through as well. So um, many questions and yeah. comments. I, as well. I'm happy. I mean, I can stay for as long as you want, but oh. um, I, I just don't want to overrun whatever it is. Okay, let's book in the next hour, everyone. Let's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you about um, rational arguments. I used to, to rely very heavily because I thought that a well constructed argument is irrefutable. And if I manage to do that, I've done my job. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I, I felt that I was betraying a part of me, mm -hmm. focusing um, on that. And then I read the auction, and I remember this, this phrase that you say that our over reliance to our rational arguments fails to take into account the limits of human uh, rationality. Correct. And then I thought, oh, well, nice. Human rationality has limits. Obviously, we are not as rational as we like to think. Right. So, <laughs> what are the limits of human rationality? Look, we cannot. <laughs> look, we cannot. We cannot. We cannot begin to think everything. If, if, if. You, look. Okay, are we not in the middle of a climate crisis, and have not the smartest people uh, among humans been working for decades to try to solve this problem? Has it even begun to be solved? There are limits uh, uh, to to uh, to human rationality, but let let me let me because this goes right to the heart actually of, of, of much of what we've been talking about, including ableism and speciesism. So, so um, going back to Aristotle, humans have defined ourselves. Aristotle defined humans as um, as uh, the rational animal, the rational animal, right? And then that <laughs> way of that way, so our rationality was, was was thought to be our absolutely defining feature, right? And so then, uh, when during the Enlightenment, uh, Europeans got into the uh, came up with the idea of species and started coming up with species names, uh, the one they chose for us was Homo sapien, the wise <laughs> ape, mm. the wise ape. So again, this reference to our supposed intellectual superiority um and 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 this 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 is uh, a key element of speciesism um it's a key element of ableism because it treats people um with cognitive disabilities or psychiatric disabilities as less rational and therefore less human yeah. um and of course on the one hand it, it's it's false Right, we we know that in fact um, uh, uh, many of our cognitive capacities are shared uh, by other non-human animals, um, including most of the ones that we have claimed only we have. Right, um, but here's the thing. This is so important to know. I'm so glad you asked this question. So the thing is, is that speciesism tells lies, right, about other animals, um, but it also tells lies about humans. And so speciesism confuses us about who other animals are. It denigrates them, but it also confuses us about who we are. It elevates us beyond what we really are, hmm. beyond who we really are. We say to err is human, but we don't believe it. Yeah. We think that humans are superior. Um, we feel it. And 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 we think that the location, the site of this superiority, is our rationality. And 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 in fact, your rationality is a very small sliver of your cognitive capabilities. Your conscious working memory can hold um, seven um, things at one time, plus or minus two. You can clump them together to have a few more in there. Um, you've got a few. More in yeah, yeah, Patrice, yeah. isn't it is isn't it true that um, we, that our conscious mind actually is only in control about 
five to ten percent of the time and the rest the rest of that 90 to 95 percent of the time it's the unconscious mind the programmed mind that's that we've kind of inherited from our upbringing from our experiences from authoritative figures from institutional you know, you know that's yes yes and no it's except i wouldn't call it the programmed mind right your brain is what i'm trying to say is, is so the vast majority of your cognition and i'm not going to give a percentage but it's certainly at 90 or more uh, far more than that. Um, uh, the vast majority of your cognition goes on outside of your conscious awareness. Some of it is essentially programmed, but a lot of it is decision making. It's choice making, mm -hmm. um, but you're not aware of it. Yeah. It's not within your conscious rational control, right? And it's all yeah. entangled with what you would call emotion. Like this idea that mm -hmm. cognition and emotion are, those are just two different words we give mm -hmm. to mental process to physical processes um occurring in the nervous system mm -hmm. and we can't separate reason. them out like people think you can no. separate mm -hmm. reason and emotion no. and you, you can't. can't you can't you separate cannot. it right yeah. so so but speciesism tells us we're the rational animal and that everything is guided by rationality so this 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 confuses us about ourselves it makes us think that we're more rational than we are it makes us think that other people are more rational than they are. It leads us to be surprised when people act on the basis of emotion rather than on the basis of rationality. But people have always acted on the basis of emotion rather than rationality. Emotion has always been a stronger determinant of behavior than rational decision making. And that's not saying you can't ever convince people with rational arguments. You can, especially if they are the kind of people who like rationality. Um, uh, um, and it also leads us to not pay attention to the body, to not pay attention to the degree to which people are amazingly affected by their physical environment and what it is easy or not easy to do based on their material surroundings. People are also social animals. And all of our thoughts and feelings evolve in a social context. You're born from another person's body all of your initial thoughts, they come in dialogue with other people. You're enormously susceptible to what gets called peer pressure as though we're like just some little thing that only happens to teenagers. But in fact, everybody is influenced by their social circumstances. If we're believing that we're the rational animal, then we're not gonna pay attention to that. We're only gonna be crafting those logical arguments to try and convince people and then being also surprised when it doesn't work. Um, Isn't it actually as well, Patrice, the elevation of the rational, an attempt to disconnect ourselves from our, our own animality in, in a way. And we're, we're, we're trying to come out of the, the body into the mind. Exactly. The, 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 the logic of domination, which is a phrase that was come up with by an uh, ecofeminist scholar, Val Plumwood, um, tells us that um, a human is better than animal, um, uh, culture is better than nature. Uh, rationality is better than emotion, male is better than female, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, dividing the whole world into these binaries um, and not just and treating the binaries as though they were opposite one another. Males are opposite females and, and, and emotion is opposite um, rationality when in fact it's a unified thing and then elevating one over the other and then um, linking all the ones that are considered elevated and all the ones that are considered um, less and so males are considered to be more rational um, e females considered to be more emotional um, mm -hmm. the mind is considered uh, to be superior to the body people of color are, are and animals are and and women are all considered more embodied more bound by their bodies than the rational males who can transcend it all and just think high thoughts um, and so all of that is part and parcel of speciesism. And when we buy into that, even if we're buying into it unconsciously, what it'll lead us to do is come up with strategies that are not as effective as they could be because they're only paying attention to one narrow, uh, one, one narrow kind of way that people um, can be influenced through rational argumentation, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I were, I had written down what did I want to make sure I, 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 I said today in, in reference to where's the body is like pay attention to the actual place that things are happening, the material circumstances, pay attention to material ecologies, pay attention to social ecologies, 
Uh, pay attention to the body and pay attention to emotion, understanding that emotion is absolutely the, and, and particularly the kind of emotion that we call desire. Desire is like the biggest driver of human behavior um, and desire for the relationships um, because we're social animals is the most live desire that we all have, right? And so, mm. and so everybody, everybody is deeply um, uh, driven at some point or not to to have joyous, um, uh, uh, healthy relationships uh, with other humans and with other and with the larger than human world. And you know, consumer capitalism and patriarchy diverts those into wanting things like destination weddings or 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 or, or things you can buy. Right, but but everybody really has this deep, deep wish um, in our bodies uh, to have really good relationships. That's the thing that will make us happiest of all. And so, you know, if we can tap into that for ourselves, then that's going to give us the energy we need to do this animal rights work, which is really about improving our relationships with non-human animals, right? And if we can be aware that other people also have this deep, 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 deep desire then that's not the call to um, when we're trying to change their behavior. Because we know that somewhere, somewhere deep inside them, they, they want better relationships. Um, and, and, um, and that they will be happier if they have them uh, than they are now. Can I, can I just jump in with a little bit of housekeeping um, uh, on, the, on, on this show at the moment, which is, is the only rational thing to do at this stage, I think. Um, uh, I mean, I knew th I knew this was going to happen because we we haven't got through. We've only got through a fraction of what we wanted to raise in terms of this session. And there's also some really great uh, contributions in in the chat. I see Turner has asked uh, two very interesting questions, and so has mm -hmm. Rama and others. Now, we have to kind of think on our feet, folks. Are we going to deal with them now, or maybe we could think about dealing with them in the comments of the subsequent video? and close down or do we want to can continue we've still got 26 people watching so thank you very much for sticking with us but um we're way over our usual time so what are we going to do folks <laughs> uh, i would say that this is uh, is available for for a few minutes more uh, to address them now uh, we're okay. on a roll <laughs> okay well, I'll, I'll 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 bring up um I see Turner's first question. Then, if yeah, I, I see had some great questions actually. Yeah. So, uh, uh, where is it? Oh, there we go. Okay, this is a two-parter. Do you, somebody want to read it out while I um, find the second part of it? Oh yeah, I see that. Yeah, I think it's um, uh, yes, it's it's uh, it's problematic. Uh, um, and yes, I did it too. And as I heard myself doing it, I didn't like it that I was doing it. Um, and I tend to be, and I apologize to everybody, uh, just in general. It's a, it's it's really hard for me to do this this Zoom thing. Um, anybody who's, I, I I like I can't see the people. Who, I can see some people. Thank God, um, uh, <laughs> because when I just try to talk at my own big giant head, it's just awful. Um, but it, it's, it's, it, 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 it just sh throws me into my head more and I also get, I feel a little dissociated. I have the whole time. And, um, and so I, I apologize for that. Um, that's, that, that's the second part of the same question there. Oh, I see. And that, that those are more, yeah, I think, you know, I think the, the one reason it, 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 it gets said that way in part is because so much of the work um, really elucidating the, uh, the um, um, intersections uh, was initially done specifically on the intersections among race and gender. Um, and, and next came class and then came um, homophobia. Um, and then, sort of in a in a in a rush, people started also thinking about ageism and 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 and, and, and disability. Not that people weren't thinking about those things separately, but I'm just talking about in terms of the intellectual evolution of, of thinking about the intersections. Um, yeah, could, could, could I, uh, if I could, so if I could ask a, a point, a good point on on that one, Patrice, because 
it's been suggested recently i've seen that um it's it's a little bit um problematic to keep applying the idea of intersectionality to other areas than where it started from whereas i seem to remember that uh kim Lee crenshaw being an academic expected you know this academic idea to be applied elsewhere and she almost like welcomed that mm -hmm. is, is that your understanding of it it's not a problem just to apply right. elsewhere so so the thing to remember is that people were doing this work this 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 conceptual work before kimberly crenshaw coined that particular work um she has um thoughts about you know uses and misuses of the word um and i'd encourage people to she's still writing and publishing today she has a, a relatively new book out so i just encourage folks to to, to read her work so um and it was actually so so uh the the earliest publication was by the kambahi river collective um in uh the late 1970s i think it was 76 or so uh where they used the phrase the interconnectedness of oppressions and then that's the phrase that we all were using um even though it really was a mouthful um before um and, 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 and until um until Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality. She was referring to a really specific kind of interaction between oppressions where the two um, not only uh, support one another, but actually uh, combine to create new forms of oppression. And that's not the only way. Um, I personally have sort of shifted over, shifted back to saying the interconnectedness of oppressions as much as, as, it's, as it's a lot of words. Um, uh, mostly because uh, as the word has intersectionality has, has become popularized, it has become uh, misused. Um, and, uh, and so, so as, as I do talk about intersections, um, but I tend to talk about the interconnectedness of, of, of oppressions. But I, I, I don't think that, that um, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not aware that Kimberly Crenshaw uh, resents uh, people using her uh, cognitive tool to think about other situations. No. I, I think another brilliant um, way of expressing it is David Nybert's idea of entanglements of oppression and liberation, personally. Ah. But, uh, yeah, we can't give David uh, credit for the word entanglement. Um, I'm, I'm sure he uses it, but we can't give him credit for that because a lot of people have, 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 have been using it for a while. Well, you can't you can for dramatic creation. It did coin that one. <laughs> so this is the second one from um, from IC um, Patrice. Um, don't you find that with in, uh, intersectionality, people try too hard to uh, present all prejudices being the same or at least equally linked? That's quite um, it's possible. Mm -hmm. I, that's not been my experience. It's certainly possible that people who are working with a sort of a superficial understanding of the concept of intersectionality uh, might uh, might make that error, um, but in fact, uh, 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 an important aspect of really thinking about um, of the interconnectedness of different forms of oppression is is appreciating the particularities as well as the similarities, um, and 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 so we're not that we're not saying that things are all the same. We're we're, we're saying uh the, these are these are different parts of of a system and and what we're interested in doing is seeing how the how the system works and how what seem to be different things are in fact in relation to one another and creating a sort of a unified uh field of 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 of, 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 of oppression but I, I i i wouldn't argue with you if you said that you've seen people do that because i, I wouldn't be surprised if, if people did that but that's certainly not um, in any way key to this way of thinking about the world. Okay, and I'm now trying to find the Rama on 6, 6, uh, 15, I think, Tom, is that right? 705, I think. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm getting there, I'm getting there, folks. Um, I'll take that one off. Um, okay. right. So easy to lose these things. Ah, here we go. Okay. 
do you think, Patrice, that human and animal liberation can happen simultaneously? Or I suppose you say simultaneously. Um, or do you think that we have to uh, have to dismantle human oppression first? I, 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 I think it can happen simultaneously. I, I'm not big on this idea that um, you know this, this, this or that one has to wait for this or that other one um, in some sort of uh, sequential. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, certainly, that's something that people will say, depending on what they want to work on. They'll sort of say, "Well, like among humans, uh, in many, many different realms, very frequently, uh, women were told, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to solve sexism once we've solved capitalism, or <laughs> once we've solved racism, uh, and 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 this was uh, uh, one of the." Uh, one part of the the, the, the genesis of, of, of black feminism was this idea uh, that um, you know within 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 femi within among white feminists there was this idea that we had to solve um, sexism first and among um, uh, male anti-racist activists there was this idea that we had to solve racism first and 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 uh, black feminists and other feminists of color were like no in fact we have to do it all simultaneously. Would you say there is, that there is also another implication too? I'm, I'm thinking right now that how is possible to liberate humans when a large part of their oppression is uh, the fact that we animalize them. So as long as uh, we, we view animals as lesser beings and we put to the animal uh, category those humans we want to, to oppress, human liberation won't, won't be pro possible. Well, one thing that I'm really, really interested in that's happening within um, uh, anti-racist theory um, and, um, and to a certain degree within disability um, rights theory in the U.S. Are, are people who aren't necessarily animal advocates or even, I don't even know what they are in their private life, whether they're vegan or, or, or not, um, really troubling this category of human. Um, and really looking at the um, really looking at the history of the category human, um, uh, really contesting what this category means, how it's defined, um, and, and in a way that's really consistent um, with some of the more forward-thinking um, uh, animal rights thinking. So I'm really curious uh, to to see how that uh, happens, uh, how that evolves, because there, there has been this sort of um, history within human liberation movements of saying, you know, stop treating us like animals, uh, with the idea that it's okay to treat animals this bad way, just don't do it to mm -hmm. us. Um, but um, there have always been people within every of these movements who are like, no, it's not okay to do that to animals either. Uh, uh, so. I, in, in, a, in a way, I guess I guess I'm still thinking about Rama's question, and I guess what I what I what I what I feel like almost is happening, possibly, is an awareness that um, it's necessary to um, dismantle human supremacy in order to solve social injustice. Right, because remember, I, I said the, the 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 at the beginning I was talking about causality going both ways, and so, and so it's not just that the ways that humans think about other humans influences how we treat animals, but these fundamental ideas we have about animals, like I've, uh, I've heard uh, one sociologist refer to speciesism as being foundational uh, to uh, to uh, to various forms of oppression among people. So um, I'm sort of hoping that what, what's going to happen is that both among animal advocates, well, three, so I shouldn't say both, but among animal advocates, among environmental activists, and among social justice activists, there are right now at least a few people in all of these locations of activism who seem to understand that dismantling human supremacy has got to be one of the things we do. 
Um, and so I'm sort of hoping um, that through conversations like this, we can establish um, through what will undoubtedly be a very difficult process of dialogue um, and often consensus that, you know, in fact, that's, that's a shared aim. That's what we're going to need to do. Look, and it may be that people come to this realization because of the climate crisis. Yeah. And we realize that, oh, in fact, for the survival of humans, we're going to need to dismantle human supremacy. Um, and then that's going to reverberate out into, into all of these other movements as well. That's certainly possible. Is it generally, Patrice, it's, it's across all these oppressions, no matter which, which one we take, whether it's speciesism, whether it's homophobia, racism, sexism, all of them, it's, it's the hierarchical thinking generally that underpins all of it, isn't it? in terms of creating supremacy, whether it's human supremacy or white supremacy or, or any of those, is it, is, it, is it about dismantling hierarchical thinking in I general? Think that, I think hierarchical thinking um, or, or what Val Plum would call the logic of domination is certainly an element of all of them. Um, I, I, I do wanna be careful in light of all of the comments that we've been talking about to recognize that there are particularities, right? Within, mm. within, within each of them and so, um uh but but certainly so i wouldn't i wouldn't say like that hierarchical thinking is the one thing shared by all of them but it certainly is a factor in virtually all of them um and it's something that we need to think about um because there's um uh, certainly uh many cultures are are hierarchical we don't even know the degree to which um apes like us have a tendency to create hierarchies like how how inbuilt that is for us i don't even know we we don't even have a way to know because we can't separate out our nature from our culture but i think we, we have to think really carefully about our tendencies to create hierarchies um and 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 what we want to do about that going forward mm. right well <laughs> This might be a good moment, as they say in court. Um, uh, well, Patrice, uh, we, we can't thank you enough. Um, it's been a brilliant um, session. And um, we, we must have you back some other time when we can ask, ask you all the things that we were going to do in the first place. <laughs> but, uh, Roger, Roger uh, before we uh, close that, uh, I just want to uh, read a very small uh, quote from Patricia's world, this is my favorite. When we affirm that we are our bodies, but deny that our bodies are property, we undermine one of the most destructive ideas in history, that people are something other than animals. I cannot tell you how much I love this quote. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this, 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 this conversation however uncomfortable it does make me to be on camera. Uh, and I, I would be delighted uh, to come back at any time to either talk about things that you wanted to ask or to talk about other things. I love to talk about um, the things that I've learned uh, through 20 years of, of running a sanctuary, the things that I've learned mm -hmm. from animals. Um, yeah. About, yeah. Um, and I, I, I should note that like every, every thought that I've had has been um, on the grounds of the sanctuary while in relation with other animals. Um, and that really, um, this mm -hmm. we have even begun to talk about the things that I have learned from other animals. So if you ever want to invite me back to talk about that, I'll be thrilled. Definitely, yeah, you're on. <laughs> One of my favorite <laughs> stories, Patricia, and I, and I, we ran over on another show recently when we were doing it, it was on, um, International Women's Day, and we focused on some of your work as well on that. And um, I, we had to stay late because I made I made Roger play the duck story. I just love the duck story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things, and and it just really brings to light how much you actually learn on the ground. Like, so we're not. What really hits me with that story and many others that you've told in your work as well is that it is about being with real individuals and you are listening to them and watching them and picking up on what they want and their agency and their self-determination and learning from that. So it's real, it's grounded, it's not just a concept and an abstract, which obviously a lot of us deal with a lot of the time. And, and I just really love that side of it. I'd love to talk to you more about that as well. So yeah, please come back. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. We'll set it up. Thank you again so much. Uh, and I Thank hope everybody, so everybody um, understood what Wendy said there. She, she made me do it. So <laughs> <laughs> I, was forced, I was forced into it against my will. I was. <laughs> right. <Of course. laughs> Right, folks, we, we, we're, we're going to say goodbye. I strongly, I strongly and, uh, insisted, let's say. <laughs> you said forced. It's on record. It's on record. Oh, damn. <laughs> damn it. <laughs> right, oh, goodbye, thanks everyone. everyone for brilliant comments as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Take care.